everyone. Thanks so much for joining with us online today. We're so glad that you're here. And although you may not be with us in our building physically, we still consider you to assist you in taking your next step in your faith journey. I'd also encourage you not to just consume our content, but contribute to it. If you'd like to give to us financially, you can go to rhythmchurch.org slash give, and it's a safe and secure way that you can give right there, as we do our best to help people find and follow the real Jesus. Before we jump in today, I just want to take a moment and really just thank our team. I don't know guys if you know this, but like everything you see on the screens, like the camera, all of the graphics, the words, that all has to be done by somebody. That doesn't just like happen. And so when you're planning to have a service in the park all week and then it rains, um, not, I mean, we kind of had an idea it might rain, but um, we just need to thank our team, our staff, especially Prudence. She got here really early to make sure that we could have church here today and everything's working normal. So I want to give her a hand just for her extra time. I know it's, it's easy just to go unnoticed, but we appreciate her so much. And it is a lot of work to kind of shift last minute and make sure everything is good to go. So we thank her today. But thank you for being here. And as Curtis mentioned, we're in this series called Kingdom Manifesto. And I don't know if I've been more excited about a series here at Rhythm than this one. Because this is just like the, the crux. This is the manifesto. It is Jesus' most famous and really, I think, most important teaching. I mean, if Jesus was to give like, hey, this is what life is about. This is what following Jesus is about. I think it's found in these chapters in the book of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's his largest audience. I think it's kind of the, the crux of what he is really all about. So we've been making our way through this. And Last week, Curtis did a great job. He preached on what it looks like to be people living under the kingdom rule of God. We found out that those who inherit the kingdom of God are poor in spirit. They're meek. They're merciful. They're peacemakers. They thirst and hunger for righteousness. They're pure in heart. And I think here, Jesus is kind of laying out what it means to be blessed in his kingdom. And it's backwards, right? It's upside down. We think that if we're going to be successful in the kingdom, we've got to have power and control and authority. Yet Jesus comes along and says, hey, here's what it really means to be blessed in my kingdom. Be a peacemaker. Become last. Then you'll become first. Become poor in spirit. It's the meek. It's the merciful who inherit the kingdom of God, who are blessed in the kingdom of God. And it's backwards. It's upside down. That's what I love about Jesus, though. He comes along and does things a little bit differently. It's interesting. When Mahatma Gandhi was once asked about how to solve the problems between Great Britain and India, he picked up a Bible. He picked up a Bible, and he opened it to the fifth chapter of Matthew, and he said this. He said, when your country and mine shall get together on the teachings laid down by Christ in this Sermon on the Mount, we shall have solved the problems not only in our countries, but for those of the whole world. Even Mahatma Gandhi recognized the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount saying, if you want to solve the issues, not only between our two countries, but the issues of the world, it's the teachings of Jesus. It's these teachings right here. And I think he's on to something there. And imagine for a second what the first century audience would have thought having heard this stuff for the first time ever. Many first century Jews were expecting a Messiah who would come on like a white horse wielding a sword to set their nation free, to destroy their enemies. Like something you'd see out of like a Lord of the Rings movie. That's ultimately what they were expecting. They were expecting something, I think, completely different because Jesus comes along and gives them something else. You see, to Jesus, the way of the kingdom is not through waving the sword. The way of the kingdom is through bearing a cross. You see, it's 
backwards. The Sermon on the Mount is an exciting and yet dangerous manifesto to change the world. Jesus, you know, he goes up to this mount to preach this sermon, but he didn't go up to the mount to escape the world's problems. I think sometimes we see that. He went up to the mount to start a revolution. He went up to the mount to start a revolution of love, a revolution that honestly is alive and well today. It's a revolution that is the reason we're here, the revolution of Jesus. So I want to keep reading this manifesto because something unique was happening here to this original audience, something transformative, something backwards, something upside down, and yet it is still that way today. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have one, that's okay. Unlike the park, we have it on the screens, so you can follow along there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I love this passage because Jesus uses two different metaphors to describe the influence that his followers would have on society. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. If we live our lives the Jesus way, if we take seriously these teachings, if we truly do our best to live like Christ, we will make an impact in a spiritually decaying culture. If, we were, if we're becoming who we're meant to be, we can't help but shine light into a world that's surrounded by darkness. I love this quote. John Stott puts it this way. This is so good. He says, Jesus calls his disciples to exert a double influence on this society. A negative influence by arresting its decay and a positive influence by bringing light into darkness. For it is one thing to stop the spread of evil. It's another to promote the spread of truth, beauty, and goodness. So good. So I think based on this text, I want to give you just some principles that I see that I think are so important when we're talking about the influence that Christians have on the world around us. If we truly are going to influence the world around us, I think here's how we do it. The first thing I would say is this, that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And this is an important distinction. Yes, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. See, in this time period, people didn't have a refrigerator, right? So salt was used primarily as a preservative. Salt prevents food from going rotten. It slows down the process of decay. But if salt is mixed with sand, for example, it's no longer effective as a preservative. It doesn't work. It doesn't work to delay corruption. It becomes useless, and then what do they do with it? Like salt and sand. They throw it on the streets, right? That's what they use to make, like, I live on, uh, like, Carolina. There's a steep hill, and when it snows, the first thing that goes down is a bunch of salt and a bunch of sand. It just gets trampled on. It, it makes, it, it, it's really useless other than to, like, keep people safe, right, from slipping all over the place. But in a similar way, if we are the salt of the earth, We have a preserving influence in a spiritually decaying society, but no doubt, we, we read every day the depressing news in the papers, crime rates, scandals, corruption cases, racial tensions, whatever it may be, 
The more rotten the world becomes, the more it needs us, the church, to keep its saltiness. But to do that, the church needs to maintain its integrity as salt of the earth. And now this is difficult. We can't get mixed up with other substances. We can't begin to lose our values. We can't start having sand mixed with the salt. We're going to become ineffective. We have to remain true to what we know and believe. It's important that we push for change, yes, but we can't compromise. Trust me, I get it. I know that the gospel will never fit perfectly with any human culture, including our own. It's difficult. And it's always tempting for us to kind of downplay or ignore the offensive parts of the gospel and harp on the bits that are easy to digest. That's always the temptation. So as we spend time again, over the next few weeks, exploring the Sermon on the Mount, we need to allow ourselves to be confronted again and again by the challenge of Jesus. Because it's easy, again, to proclaim the parts that are easy to, to digest. It's difficult when we're faced with Jesus and we're challenged, we just, the temptation is to skip it over and just be like, eh, they didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean love your enemies. He didn't really mean we're the salt of the earth. He didn't really mean that. But we need to be confronted again with all of Jesus and all of his teachings. We need to allow these teachings to transform us again. But if we just pick and choose what we like and ignore those that are challenging, I think we run the risk of watering down the good news, watering down the truth to fit nicely into our kind of cultural baggage instead of being countercultural. We can begin to compromise to the world. And I also understand that I think sometimes the church has gotten a lot of things wrong. And that's this, what happens with humans, right? We're imperfect people. But I think more and more our church, specifically this church, we're trying to get closest to the original disciples. If you listen to our podcasts, we talk about more controversial topics in length. So if you haven't downloaded that, I encourage you to go on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you get podcasts, and listen to our podcast. It's called The Current, Real Talk on Real Topics. We address everything that we think in a much healthier dialogue. It's not me standing on a stage trying to convince a room full of people what we believe to be true. It's, it's healthy. But you'll notice over and over again in that podcast, we talk about the importance of trying to get back to what the earliest disciples believed. Because that eliminates the corruption that can happen through time through people trying to figure out what it is. Anytime there's humans involved. So what did the first disciples believe? And, and yes, like we see in Scripture this idea that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're set apart. We're a group of people that are different. And we have to remain different. There's, a, there's kind of a phrase that, that I love to use often, and it might be on our website, I can't remember, but... There's this idea that we're not too heavenly minded for any earthly good. We have to remain that way. And there's also this, this phrase about culture, where we're not above culture, where we're not having any influence. We're not beneath culture, where we've lost all our influence. But we say that we're for the culture. We're for it. We want to redeem it. We want to partner with God in what he's doing to be for the culture. We're in the world, but not of the world. The, the second implication, I think, when Jesus talks about us being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, he says we have to engage, not isolate. We have to engage, not isolate. Jesus goes on to talk about darkness, but here's the reality. Did you know that darkness isn't an actual thing? This might blow your mind a little bit. Darkness is not an actual thing. 
Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness only exists when light doesn't. Does that make sense? When the light is turned on, darkness is gone. Light is a thing. The very presence of light dispels the darkness. And as light of the world, we reflect God's truth, we reflect God's love, we reflect God's grace to a world that is full of the absence of light, a world that's full of darkness. The scriptures say this, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So just being different isn't really enough. And that's why this, I say the second point. We have to engage, not isolate. We can't just be like, oh, we're just different for the sake of being different. We're just the people that are set apart. We have to engage. Because I think the temptation is always to be like this little holy huddle off in the corner where we just kind of do our own thing and we're not engaging with the world around us. We cannot be that way. Let me ask you, does salt do any good in the salt shaker? I mean, that's essentially what Jesus is saying. Is light do any good if you put it under a bowl? No. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying people don't light a, a, a light and then stick a bowl over it. No, they put it on a stand so it lights up the whole room. People don't have salt just to put it on the ground. And trample on it. That's what Jesus is saying. No, it's used as a preservative. We preserve the culture. There's a purpose. There's a use for it. We have to engage. We cannot be isolated. There's a, a famous saying, and, and some of you may have heard this before as well, but I love this. The only thing needed for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. Let me say that again. The only thing needed for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. Just like darkness isn't an actual thing, I wonder if evil isn't an actual thing. I wonder if evil is just the absence of good. All we need to do is fold our arms and do nothing. And darkness will have its way. The reality is, though, we have some great examples of the church changing the culture. The church at its best. During a, a time period of the church called the Great Awakening, there's a revival. It was under these men. And you may have heard some of these names. Um, George Whitefield, the Wesley Brothers, William Wiberforce, Lord Shaftesbury, and others. There's this Great Awakening. There's this revival that happened in history. The gospel was being preached. Churches were planted. People were inspired to take up social causes in the name of Christ. There's the proclamation of the gospel, the demonstration of the gospel. Those have always gone hand in hand, in word and in deed. That's always been the method. The gospel is proclaimed in word, but it's also proclaimed in deed. There has to be something attached to it. You can't just proclaim the gospel and not show love to your neighbor. You can't just show love to your neighbor and not proclaim the gospel. They always go hand in hand. And and I want to share this kind of story with you of what happened. And, and there's a movie, if, if you'd rather watch the movie. It's called Amazing Grace, but it's, it's based on the life of William Wilberforce. Wilberforce. Wilberforce was a Christian member of parliament in Great Britain who worked his whole life to abolish slavery of the African people. By the way, of human trafficking, uh, yeah, by the way, human trafficking is alive and well today. This isn't something that's just disappeared, unfortunately. So there's still a need here. But Wilberforce launched his first campaign to abolish slavery in 1787. Now, let this sink in for a second. He first launched this in 1787. He finally saw his efforts succeed in 1833, just three years before his death. Forty-six years in total. And that just reminds us that like social efforts, social justice, making a difference in the world is a long 
fought battle. It's a painful marathon. It's not a sprint. It takes work and dedication and commitment to bring about change. It's easy to get burnt out, but the people of God, we have a a calling. We have an expectation. Jesus says, if you can have everything in the world, but you lose your soul. He says things like that, or he says, hey, if you can have faith and love, but the grace of these, faith and hope, but the grace of these is love. He speaks to uh, the Pharisees over and over again in the New Testament, and he says, hey, you know all the right things, but yet you fail to love your neighbor. You might have all the right answers, but if you're not feeding the poor, helping those in need, helping those who society has deemed as outcasts or those that are unable to help themselves, if we're not fighting for those people, we're not doing the work of God. And fortunately for William Wiberforce, he has a group of friends who walk together with him. And this small group was nicknamed the Clapham sect or the saints. They, they shared this deep conviction in the evangelical church for a long time. And honestly, they, so many things we see were started from these guys. Many social efforts. They started like Bible colleges. And so many things came from this small group of people who were committed to making a difference in the world around them, who were committed to being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, just as Jesus has told us to be. And honestly, I would say I think that's what we want like our community groups here at Rhythm to be like. I mean, can you imagine like, the, the difference or the impact when a group of people who are empowered by the gospel are passionate about being the salt of the earth and the light of the world? We have to engage, not isolate. We can't just do our own thing week in and week out. We have to engage, not isolate. The last thing I would say is this. We have to be influential, but we also have to be respectful. Being salt and light implies that Christians should influence the broader society. We should be influencing the broader society. Salt hinders decay. Light dispels darkness. We, we cannot create a perfect society today as suggested by a social gospel, but we can improve it. We can improve the world around us. We can, we can make a difference. But it's funny because the moment we say that, the moment we say, oh, well, we're going to we're going to take our faith to the streets. We're going to start we're going to start telling people about Jesus. We're going to start making a difference in the world around us. You know the pushback. Trust me, you've heard it and I hear it too. The pushback is always, uh-oh. Are you going to try to impose your Christian values on everybody else? You need to keep your faith private, okay? Like don't bring that out in public. Well, there are many public issues that call for prayer and action. And as Christians, we can't just sit by and watch things happen. Jesus, and again, this is some of his brilliant teachings. He talks about a time in which people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord. will cry out, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. And he goes on to say, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you come visit me? When I was in need, did you give me that need? And he separates the sheep from the goats. And you see, faith without action, faith without love is, is worthless. Sometimes, and the reason I say like we need to be influential and respectful, because I think sometimes 
Christians can be so hateful in their approach. Can just be so hateful in their approach. We have to do both. Yes, we have to be influential, but we also have to be respectful. We have to show people love and kindness and grace while also proclaiming truth. It's possible to do both, but what we can't do is sit back and do nothing. Tim Keller has this quote. It's really long, but I love it, and he's a lot smarter than I am, so I'm going to share it with you. Stay with me. This is really good. It's really long. We're going to read it. Christians should be in a community radically committed to the good of the city as a whole. We must move out to sacrificially serve the good of the whole human community, especially the poor. The ultimate purpose of redemption is not to escape the material world. Don't miss that. The ultimate purpose of redemption is not to escape the material world. Again, for so long, Chris was like, oh, I'll fly away. Can't wait to get out of here. Forget this world. We're getting out. We're going to heaven. No. The ultimate purpose of redemption is not to escape the material world, but renew it. God's purpose is not only saving individuals, but also inaugurating a new world, a new kingdom, a new way to live based on justice, peace, love, not power, strife, and selfishness. So Christians work for the peace, security, justice, and prosperity of their city and their neighbors, loving them in what? Word and deed, whether they believe what we do or not. In Jeremiah 29, 7, here's a great example. Israel's exiles were called not just to live in the city, but also to love it and work for its shalom, work for its peace, its economic, social, and spiritual flourishing. The citizens of God's city are the best possible citizens of their earthly cities. Now, I love this part. Don't miss this. This is the only kind of cultural engagement that will not corrupt us and conform us to the world's pattern of life. If Christians go to urban centers simply to acquire power, they will never achieve cultural influence and change that is deep, lasting, and embraced by a broader society. We must live in the city to serve all the peoples in it, not just our own tribe. We must lose our power to find our power. Again, the early disciples thought, well, the Messiah's coming. He's going to come on a horse with a sword, and he's going to destroy all our enemies. But Jesus shows up and says what? If you want to find your life, you must lose it. Take up your cross daily. Christianity will not be attractive enough to win influence except through sacrificial service to all people regardless of their beliefs. <clears throat> In other words, our cultural engagement must be shaped by the cross of Jesus Christ. Sacrificial love, sacrificial service, denying of ourself, putting others before ourselves, no strings attached. Like Jesus, who instead of grabbing power with all of his might and an army of angels, Instead, he decided to carry a cross for the sake of others. He saved the world through weakness and self-sacrifice. And in the same way, true spiritual power in the church comes when we renounce coercive power and bear our, Christ, bear our cross with Christ instead. And I, I believe that evangelicalism and social action belong together, for sure. Neither of them should be a means to the other. They're equal partners. Our good works should, yes, express genuine love for our neighbor who's in need. But love doesn't need to justify itself. It's not a means to, like, a, a hidden agenda there's no strings attached. We share the good news because we love people. We make a difference in the world because we truly love people.
But we don't show love to people as an excuse to evangelize to them. There's no strings attached. That's what Jesus did. No strings attached. If they don't want to respond or listen to the gospel, does that mean we stop loving them? No. No way. But this is the movement that Jesus is beginning. This is the the kingdom manifesto. This is the heart behind it all. He's saying, hey, this church, this group of people, these people I'm raising up, these people I'm setting apart, you're the salt of the earth. You're preserving culture, but you're also the light of the world. You're proclaiming that light. You're putting the light on the post so that everybody can see you're What happens with this group of people as the salt and the light, you're making a difference in the culture around you. There's something happening here. We're influential, but we're also respectful. And this is what, at the heart of Jesus' message, and again, we're going to get to this, and I love this because it's all included in this few chapters. Like, if you're new to Christianity, by the way, like, if you're checking out church, you haven't really been to church in a while, or you have questions about God, read, read the Sermon on the Mount. Just start there. It'll answer a lot of your questions. But included in this section, the New Testament, the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? And we'll get here. But how should we pray? And I know I say this all the time, but I'm going to just say this until I'm blue in the face because it's so important. The people closest to Jesus say, how are we supposed to pray? And this is what Jesus says. Pray like this. My Father, who's in heaven, worthy are you, hallowed be your name. And notice the next line. He says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If Jesus' prayer, the model prayer, if Jesus was asked how to pray, and he thought it was important enough to say, Thy kingdom come here, now, in these moments, in this time, not someday, but right now, I think we as Christians should be concerned about the right here and now too. Making a difference right where we are, being the salt of the earth and the light of the world right here, right now, today, in these moments. I mentioned the Lord of the Rings earlier. I'm not a big fan of Lord of the Rings, but I do like movies. Um, I like to think about the church this way. The church is like a movie preview. We're like displaying the teasers, the highlights. You know when you, you see like a, what do they call it, the trailer? Well, they put the best parts in there. I don't know if you know that. Well, they should. I think they do. Because I watch them, like, I've already seen this, but it's really good. But see, the idea is you see the trailer. So you see the church. You're seeing the movie trailer so that people will go, wow, I can't wait to see the real show. I can't wait to see the real deal. And it's like Jesus is like, yeah, coming soon to a planet near you, right? It's like. (laughs) But the question for us, and it's always the same, will we actively be a part of this movement? Will you choose today to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Or will we continue to do our thing? Fall to the temptation of, of not engaging, but isolating. Or maybe we do champion some social efforts and try to make a difference all around us, but we do it hatefully with judgment and condemnation rather than with respect and love and grace. I hope you'll be a part of it. I hope you'll be a part of what God is doing, not someday, but right now. Right now in these moments. 
There is a world that is absence of light. There is a world around us that is decaying, and we're the salt. Let's do our jobs. Let's get after it. Let's be a part of building God's kingdom right here, right now. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for our time together again. And I, My heart just explodes just thinking about the self-sacrificial love that Jesus showed. Again, like so much of our culture and our world today thinks that we take over and get power and, and advance and move on by overcoming and but really you teach us in this sermon, this most famous sermon of all time that your son preached that in order to really find our life and in really order to advance in your kingdom, we need to take a step back. We really need to put others before ourselves. And God, I just pray for my heart. I pray for this church. I pray for the people sitting in these seats, the people listening online. that you would do a work in us and that each and every day we would commit to taking a back seat. Whether we're running a business, whether we're teaching in a classroom, whether we're staying at home with kids, whatever it may be, that we would do so in a way that's building your kingdom. Maybe offering grace when it's not deserved. Maybe being a little more patient maybe meeting the need of somebody around us, maybe seeing a need, maybe fighting for social causes, whatever it may be. God, may we be a group of people who passionately pursue your kingdom by laying ourselves down, by putting others before ourselves, by being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.